Good morning, Capital City Church. It's Rick Mellick. I'm down here this morning on a beautiful day at the Capitol Grounds in downtown Des Moines, Iowa. And we are in the third week of our fall series called Jesus Said Don't. Now, if you've been following along, you know the very first week we talked about the Old Testament law and how Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament, that it wasn't necessary for a Christian, a person, a Gentile to become Jewish before they actually became a follower of Christ. Last week, we talked about the impossible command or the uh, command that seemed impossible. Jesus said, don't fear, do not be afraid. This week, the don't command that we're going to cover, that we're going to talk about seems equally as impossible. But we know that when Jesus commands it, when he invites us to live a certain way, not only is it possible, but it's the way we're supposed to live. And when we do, we find freedom. Jesus said, don't sin. Now, don't cut me off yet. Don't tune me out. I know it seems hard to imagine to leave a life of sin because inside all of us, there's something that we wish wasn't there, something we wish we could get rid of, sin that keeps us from being right with each other and right with God. Now, the story this morning takes place at the temple, and the temple, well, the closest thing I could come archaeologically was the Capitol grounds down here in downtown Des Moines. There are steps, there's courtyards, and well, you'll see in a minute that our story takes place in the courtyard of the Gentiles at the temple in Jerusalem. Now, all good Jews, at least one time a year, had to go to the temple and offer sacrifices for the temporary forgiveness of sins. Now, I know we're not really talking about Jewish people becoming believers. We're talking about Gentiles. But the story that takes place today takes place in a time and at a location where Gentiles were welcome into the temple to hear the truth about who Jesus was, even though that wasn't the intention of the Pharisees who set this all up. Now, when a Jew would come to the temple, they would come almost always from the south and they would come up the Pilgrim's Road. So if you look here behind me, you can see a road. Well, it's not quite the Pilgrim's Road, but if you can imagine this being a road back in Jerusalem, back in Jesus' day, down at the very end of the road was the Pool of Siloam. Now, you might remember the Pool of Siloam. It was used by Jesus as the setting for a miracle that he did, where he actually took some mud, put it on a blind man's eyes, and restored his sight. But it was also a place where many of the Jews, as they traveled to the temple, would purify themselves with the water as they made their way up to the southern gates of the temple. Now, when they came up the Pilgrim's Road, they would come to the southern steps. And it was really important as they walked up the southern steps to understand what they were doing and where they were going. So as they followed along this, this Pilgrim's Road and they came to the southern wall of the temple, the wall was about 950 feet. It was massive. And in the middle of that wall, there was one central gate that had steps that were about 250 feet wide. The steps, the southern steps, recently uncovered by archaeologists, um, are steps that were designed by Herod, actually. Now, you may know the history of the temple. The Jewish temple built by Solomon was destroyed well before uh, Jesus was born. And then a few years later after that, it was rebuilt, but it wasn't rebuilt very well. And so Herod decided, and this was about the time of Jesus, that he was going to rebuild the temple or remodel the temple to make it more accurate or to scale. And he expanded the temple and he built some stairs in the southern side of this temple that all the Jews during Jesus' day would have had to, to walk up that were staggered and taller than normal stairs. And the point was that people would have to know what they were doing coming to the temple. They would have to be intentional and thoughtful, preparing themselves. Now, as a Jew would walk up into the temple, they would look over to the eastern side and they might remember a time when Jesus himself, as a 12-year-old boy, was arguing with the Pharisees, or at least debating scripture with them, when Mary and Joseph lost him and had a hard time finding him. And he said, where else would I be but in my father's house? Outside the temple, there were these 250 foot wide steps that oftentimes the rabbis and the teachers would spread crowds out along and they would teach them because the acoustic effects were just perfect and they were able to sit sort of amphitheater style. And the temple had restrictions on it, but there was a courtyard, as you may remember, called the Courtyard of the Gentiles. So come with me to the Courtyard of the Gentiles. Let's walk up these steps on the southern gate of the temple in Jerusalem and let's see what happens next. All right, we'll get back to the temple in a minute, but let's talk for a second about sin. Isn't that a great way to start a sermon, talking about sin? You guys ready to talk about some sin? 
Anybody want to confess? Raise your hands, get, get it out there so we all know. Somebody raised their hand. That, that would be a whole different kind of church service, wouldn't it? If we just, we all deal with it. Sin, any thought, any action, any attitude that's displeasing to the Lord. We all have thoughts, actions, and attitudes that are displeasing to God. And there's a promise that Jesus makes. And you're going to see this in a minute in the story that we're going to be talking about that takes place in the court of the Gentiles in the temple, where Jesus actually looked at someone who was guilty of both thoughts, actions, and attitudes that were displeasing to God and was able to say, go and leave your life of sin. Sin, thoughts, actions, attitudes, displeasing to the Lord, entered the world way back in the beginning and in Genesis when Adam and Eve were created to know God, to worship God, to be with God and experience him with all of their senses. Nothing between them and between God. And the first sin entered the world through the first, well, the author of sin, Satan, who disguised himself in the form of an animal, of a serpent, and the first deception, the first lie was told. And Eve chose to eat from the fruit of the one tree that was forbidden. She in turn had Adam eat from the fruit of the tree, which, you know, I don't really blame Adam or Eve. If you and I had been there, we probably would have done it too. And because Eve believed the serpent and chose not to believe God, sin entered the world. Now sin wrecked the world. When Adam and Eve chose to sin, God's heart was broken. And God is loving and merciful, but he's also holy and just. And because he was holy and just, he had to pronounce a curse, a penalty for sin. And so he placed a curse on all of humankind so that everyone born from the time of Adam and Eve would have been born sinful. The New Testament tells us all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. That the wages of sin, the just deserve of sin is uh, death, but yet there's a free gift of God that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so sin entered the world and sin wrecked the world. And there are really two types of sin. Makes me think of a wedding. I know that's a weird transition, isn't it? But I just did a wedding yesterday. And as you know, um, weddings aren't my favorite things to do. I've shared this with you. I'll share it again. I don't really like doing weddings because all a person can do as a pastor is mess a wedding up. You can't really make a wedding better. If somebody knows you're there, you've probably done something wrong. And so we had a uh, rehearsal, um, which happens on Friday in this case, and then a wedding that happened on Saturday. And I really enjoy the people that I did the wedding for. And, and uh, actually it was the brother of Nathan, my uh, son's girlfriend, Leah. They're here today this morning in town for the weekend. So that was a nice bonus getting to hang out with them. Uh, but I uh, get everybody together, no matter the wedding. And on Friday during the rehearsal, I say, look, guys, let's not screw this up because there's lots of things that can go wrong at weddings. So don't do any of them. And I have the party with me, the bride, the groom, the best man, the, the maid of honor, all of the attendants, even the little flower kids that run around uh, doing their flower kid thing. And I said, things can go wrong. Let's not do any of those things because we live in a world where things go wrong. We live in a world where accidents are waiting right around the corner. We live in a world where mess ups, omissions, oversights, or even intentional acts are just a step away. And so I said, let's not mess it up. So I look at the maid of honor and I said, are you gonna have the ring tomorrow during the ceremony? And she said, yes. And I said, don't lose it. She said, I'm not gonna lose it. And I say, everybody says that people lose it all the time. And then I tell them stories, horrible stories about weddings that were destroyed by mistakes that they make. I said, I was in a wedding and the maid of honor dropped the ring and it rolled about six rows back under the legs of all the people who were seated in the crowd, seated in the crowd. They were all on their hands and knees trying to find the ring delayed the wedding for a good 10 minutes. It was horrible. I look over at the best man, or you have the ring? Yes, I do. Are you going to, to lose the ring? No, I'm not. And then I tell him the story of the best man who stuck the ring on his pinky, got it stuck because his pinky was too big, couldn't get it off his pinky. And so had the bride pulling the finger, trying to get the, it was just horrible. And I said, don't do that. Don't put it on, on your pinky. I've been in weddings where I have seen brides blow the unity candle out without taking the veil up off their face. I have seen veils light on fire in the middle of a wedding. I've seen things. I actually saw one person who was responsible for situating the train of the bride's dress um, when the bride positioned herself toward the pastor next to the groom, backside toward the congregation. The lady who was responsible for shushing the dress 
walked around back to the 10 foot train, gave it one of these, which came up high enough for everybody in the crowd to see most of, you get one backside of, yeah, that was my wedding. That was my wedding that that happened at. I know, it was terrible. Things happen. I said, don't do those things. So on Saturday, the wedding comes. And so far, it's going great. I was awesome. I mean, I was one. I, I hadn't messed up one time, stuck to the script, used my notes, get in the background, easy peasy. And um, things can happen. We live in a world where things can happen all the time. They just are right around the corner. So everything's going well. I go through the message, say my funny things. Everybody laughs, talk about the Lord, which is really important. We do our vows. We exchange the rings. They do their unity ceremony move to the back like I'm supposed to, stand there, I'm out of the pictures, everything's going well. The bride and the groom begin to walk back toward the front of the stage. I take my place behind them and here's what I do. I feel something under my foot as I'm following the bride back up to the front of the stage. And she is doing this and looks at me and it wasn't a dirty look, it was a something's not right look. And I'm standing on her train, keeping her from being able to walk up and complete the wedding. And I'm the one who had totally messed things up. Now here's the point, the wedding went on and it was fine, but there are two types of sin. There's the sin that happens just because we live in a world where accidents, missteps, bad things are right around the corner. People get sick, wars happen, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. We live in a sinful world that's been cursed and Jesus came to reverse the curse. But sometimes we step on the train. Sometimes we're the ones that jump right in willingly. Maybe sometimes accidentally. Maybe sometimes we're not even sure. We find ourselves committing these acts, these thoughts, actions, attitudes, displeasing to the Lord. And we know that sin separates, that sin suffocates, that it suppresses. We know that sin kills. It hurts our relationship with God. It destroys our relationship with those who are closest to us. It begins to erode away our conscience and our spirit. And we all deal with it. And Jesus says these words, go and leave your life of sin. And it seems impossible seems unlikely, but in the story that I'm gonna tell you in a few minutes, I see it as a promise, and I think you will too. We're gonna to pray, and we're gonna sing some songs, and we're singing the songs of worship to the Lord. They're like prayers from our mouth to God's ears, and we're gonna listen as God speaks back to us. Now, I've had asked some friends to come and stand here in the front on either side, and if you wanna pray with somebody this morning, if there's someone uh, that uh, you wanna just walk up and just kinda grab them and share a request that maybe you have, maybe a burden that you're bearing for someone else, um, or if uh, there's just something heavy on your heart, we would love to pray with you. So as you finally made it up these steps on the Southern gate on the Southern side of Jerusalem, and they called it the Temple Mount, you came to the first courtyard, the courtyard of the Gentiles. The courtyard of the Gentiles was a large courtyard and it had sort of a, a fence in stone around it with about 256 pillars and people would use these pillars to lean against and they would teach. Oftentimes, the leaders of the religious faith at the time, Judaism, would gather crowds even inside the courtyard of the Gentiles. But the courtyard of the Gentiles was also the place that Jesus drove out the money changers on two different occasions. It was a place where people could purchase uh, the animals that they were going to end up sacrificing for the atonement of their sins it was a place of lots of activity, and it was a place where Gentiles were allowed, non-Jews were allowed to come. Now, if you continued further on, you could not go if you were not Jewish. And there was a sign that actually uh, said, before you entered into the courtyard of the women, which was the next level up, it said, if you are not a Jewish person, and if you have not been circumcised as a man, and you continue past this gate, you're gonna lose your life, and it will follow very, very shortly. So no one really uh, went past uh, the courtyard of the Gentiles, unless they were a devout, God-fearing Jew. But when they did, they would go up into the courtyard of the women, where the women were allowed to offer their sacrifices. And there were little pots that they would put their sacrifices in. You might remember a story about the widow who gave just a mite, a small offering to the Lord and offered her heart as well as her money. That would have taken place in the courtyard of the women. Up from there was the courtyard of the Jewish men. And then you would pass up another set of stairs, even further up to the Temple Mount. You would get to the courtyard of the priests. 
and then there was an altar where animals would be sacrificed, and then even further up was the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was placed inside the Ark of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments. You probably know the story, we've talked about it before, but this story today takes place all the way down in the courtyard of the Gentiles. Jesus was up, and the Bible says, early one morning, so it was probably dawn, and he came to the temple to teach. This is found in the book of John. You can follow along with me if you like. Jesus came to the courtyard to teach, and he often did this. And as he was there early in the morning, probably just taking a comfortable seat next to one of the columns in the courtyard of the Gentiles, he began to teach, I wish we knew about what, but we don't. And the Bible says that all of the sudden, Pharisees and leaders of religious law came dragging up the stairs a woman who was caught in adultery. Now, the story may be familiar to you, but I want you to think about it in a way you've never thought about it before. This was morning time. The Jews were commanded to offer sacrifices two different times of the day. There was a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice. So at least one lamb had to be sacrificed in the morning, just a couple of courtyards up, just separated by a few stairs and some short stone walls. And oftentimes during festivals, as was this time of year, many more animals were having to be sacrificed. So it's quite possible that in the background of Jesus teaching and this woman being dragged up the stairs, that there were the sounds of dying animals going on in the background. A woman who the Bible says was caught in adultery was dragged up the stairs and placed in front of Jesus. And the Bible says that they waited, these Pharisees, these leaders of the religious law, until a crowd had gathered. So if you can imagine the crowd coming in, minding their own business, seeing something going on, and they did this to try to trap Jesus. Now, a couple things come to mind. The first is um, this woman who was caught in adultery. Where in the world was the man? Because it takes two to tango, as the saying goes. Secondly, what did they do with her? They caught her at night, obviously, having some sort of an adulterous relationship, had her stowed away to save her for the right time to come and to try to trap Jesus. So they drug her up the stairs. Now, can you imagine this woman? We don't know what her situation was, what her circumstances, but we knew, though, she'd been caught. The Bible doesn't say that she was just accused. It doesn't say that she was falsely accused. The Bible says that she was caught in the act of adultery. She was guilty. How many times had she walked up the southern stairs at the temple to offer her own sacrifices and offerings to the Lord? How many times had she come up and gone down those same stairs? But can you imagine this time being dragged by a group of men intent on proving a point with her and her life being dragged up the stairs, realizing that you, like the sounds that you may hear of the dying animals just up a few flights of steps behind you, you may die and you may never come back down. So as the story goes, they, these Pharisees drug her up and put her at Jesus' feet. And they said, Jesus, the Old Testament law says that adultery is a capital offense, that anyone who commits adultery is worthy of being stoned. What say you? And the Bible says that all these men had stones in their hands. They were standing around her and they were ready to throw rocks at her until she was dead. Now, if you pay close attention to the story, you see that Jesus, he waits. And this pause, this pregnant pause as Jesus waits was, I think, for two reasons. One, for the crowd to finish sort of milling around and finally gather so that they, in fact, can hear and see what Jesus is getting ready to do. And number two, I think to let these people, these accusers, really understand what they're doing and really gather the setting that's around them and the magnitude and the holiness of the temple of the Lord and maybe allow it to sink in. Maybe they'd have a change of heart, but they didn't. And so as the woman lay at Jesus' feet and as these accusers with their rocks ready to pounce tell Jesus, the Old Testament says this is what you're supposed to do. What are you going to do? The Bible says that Jesus knelt down next to this woman and he wrote something in the sand. Now, nobody expected Jesus to kneel down and to write in the sand. And as he wrote with the finger, many people wonder what he wrote. Now, the truth is nobody knows, but you may not know this. The ancient Jews believed that God, when he wrote the Ten Commandments, it, well, they say the finger of God wrote the Ten Commandments and etched them into the stone tablets before Moses took them down from the mount. And, and many people think that Jesus, as he was writing into the sand with his finger, was completing the Ten Commandments, the commandments of God. And we know that Jesus didn't come to abolish the Old Testament law, but to fulfill it. The Ten Commandments themselves, we no longer are under the Ten Commandments. There's a new law, not inconsistent with the Ten Commandments, but completing the intentions of God as Jesus came to do His work. And so whatever Jesus wrote, we know that it was something significant. 
And I also want you to note that it was something personal. We don't know what Jesus wrote. We don't know what Jesus whispered in this woman's ear. But we do know that Jesus put himself down with this woman at her level. In a sense saying, if you're going to throw a stone at her, you're going to throw a stone at me. Whatever he said to her, whatever he wrote in the sand was between Jesus and her. It was personal. It was private. It was a moment between Jesus and a woman who was stuck, knowing that her life may have come to the end. And so Jesus waited another moment. Again, maybe waiting for the accusers to have a twinge of conscience or to let good judgment prevail. But we know because we've read this story and I'm telling you this story, they didn't and they were readying themselves with their rocks and they were ready to pounce. And Jesus says these words. He says, anyone who is without sin cast the first stone. And then once again, Jesus waits. So Jesus is sitting next to the woman. The men are standing there poised and ready to throw rocks. And then as the story goes, the men begin to drop their rocks, beginning with the oldest, because the very place where they were in the temple of the Lord with the altar in the temple of the priest or the courtyard of the priest just above them reminded them of the impossible nature of permanent atonement for sin and how many times they had to offer sacrifices for temporary forgiveness, how many times that they'd sinned and fallen short in their own lives and perhaps they just were overwhelmed at that moment. Maybe they were angry and they dropped their rock. And then the Bible says that men continue to drop their rocks all the way down to the youngest hotheads at the end. And I love this next part. And this is one of the things you may never have caught. The story goes that after they dropped their rocks, they turned and they left the temple. Now, this is the crazy part of the story. It's the part I love so much. Because these men were absolutely hell-bent on revenge. You had broken God's law and you were going to be punished. And what Jesus is saying is, yes, she broke God's law, but it also broke God's heart. And look how broken she is. And there's forgiveness for sins. You don't have to pay the price for your own sins. In a sense, even since Jesus had not died yet, he's saying, you put her sin on my account. I'll pay the price. And just a few days later, we see, in fact, that he did that. But these men, in their anger, in their frustration, when the temple itself was being turned into a place of grace, scandalous grace, the Bible says that they left the temple. It happens a lot of times in church. People who prefer legalism and rules and judgment over love and grace and mercy. People who would rather be a little hypocritical and a little defensive and a little withdrawn. Exposing other people's sins to gain power and control. When they realize that a church is really becoming a place of grace, they do two things. They try to run out the leadership or when they really see that there is no other way but Jesus' way, they in fact oftentimes leave themselves. So off they went into the distance, and Jesus was left alone with the woman. Her still not knowing exactly who Jesus is. Jesus down here with her, and as he is with her on her level, having a moment, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, the Son of God, with a woman who was guilty, who was ashamed, who was stuck, who had a death sentence that had suddenly been lifted. He looked at this woman and he said, who's left to condemn you? Maybe he smiled, and she said, no one. Lord. And he said, neither do I condemn you. And I think at that point he smiled again. And perhaps you have no idea what this is like. That Jesus would be a non-condemning, forgiving Christ. Maybe the Jesus you grew up with, the Jesus your preacher talked about, the Jesus that your church represented, the Jesus that perhaps your family even, you know, told you about wasn't really the Jesus who would say something like, I don't condemn you either. The tone of Jesus' words, the compassion in his voice, the love in his heart. And this woman was being changed. Now, if that was the end of the story, it certainly wouldn't be enough. It would leave us wanting more. But after Jesus said, neither do I condemn you, and then I think he looked her in the eyes, seeing her as Jesus does, and the same way he sees us, the way we are, the way we used to be and the way we can become. And I think Jesus, as he looked her in the eyes, he said to her, go and leave this life of sin. Go and live a different way. You can be a different person. Take me by the hand and let's change your life. And friends, that's what Jesus does. Even in the middle of the temple that represented God's justice and punishment for sin, in one day, in one miraculous, instantaneous moment intended to trap Jesus so that they might take his life at the will of the crowd. 
Jesus turned this place of judgment and atonement into a place of grace and life change. Is it possible not to sin? Is it possible to go and leave a life of sin behind? Not only is it possible, but Jesus tells us it's the way it's supposed to be. So now if you go to Jerusalem, and I have not been, I'd like to, um, the southern steps, as I mentioned, have been recently uh, ex excavated or um, restored, and you can walk up them, and um, they're about 250 feet wide, as I've mentioned, um, kind of irregularly shaped, difficult to walk up. And if you walk up those stairs to the temple, as so many Jews did for so long, when you get to the top, you find that the temple has been walled off, and there's no way to get in. And the beautiful part about that is that we don't have to go in anymore. That the Old Testament law was, the rule was, you break God's law, you pay the price. You break God's law, there's a price to pay. And what Jesus was defining here in this story with this woman in the court of the Gentiles was, if you break God's law, you break my heart because I've seen how sin has broken you and when Jesus said to this woman, I don't condemn you, there was something so beautiful about this, but so revolutionary because the law condemned. And this woman listening to these words and the crowd that had gathered around, well, it was life-changing. Maybe you've never heard those words. Sometimes I get uncomfortable with religious leaders. I guess I am one, but you never really quite know where you stand, right? You're just not 100% sure sometimes. And the beautiful thing about what Jesus was going to do is that you never have to wonder where you stand with someone who's willing to give their life for you. And Jesus, as he was meeting this woman, said to God the Father, essentially, Take her sin and put it on my account because I'm going to pay the price. She can't pay. I can't pay. You can't pay. Jesus said, I will pay. And do you know what? He did. Because sin separates us from God. It separates us from the people who are around us. Sin is a substitute for that right relationship with God that Adam and Eve had experienced in the garden. And, and sin suppresses our conscience and our spirit to the point where we don't even know who we are. So if you've never come to the point where you've accepted Jesus Christ, maybe today is that day. Are you willing to confess your sin? The sin that just happens because we are born into a cursed world and the curse fell on us. The sins that happen because we step on the train ourselves and stop the wedding in its tracks. Are you willing to believe who Jesus is as we've described and explained him today? God, God's son who lived a perfect life and died a death he didn't deserve to pay a price we couldn't pay. And when he rose again, he defeated sin, Satan and death once and for all so that anyone who is in him can be free. And all you have to do is ask. It's a free gift of God, not because of anything we can do or who we are, anything we've done or how smart we are or righteous or good, it's just a free gift given to us through God's grace and our faith. But sometimes after we've made this decision to follow Christ, we slip back into sin, thoughts, actions, attitudes, displeasing to the Lord. And we're experiencing the suppression of conscience, the separation from others and from God, the damage of sin in our life. What's your sin? The thing that you keep finding yourself dealing with over and over and over again. Would you believe it if I told you, Jesus said, it's possible to leave your life of sin behind. Now, it's not possible through your own strength and power, but through his, it is. And the Apostle Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 6, verse 18. And he says this very powerful thing that's true coming from the Holy Spirit of God to us. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Righteousness is a right relationship to God, right heart, right thoughts, right actions. 
you have been set free from sin and you have become a slave to right thoughts, the right heart, the right action. Now I've had a chance to make this personal over the last week and I'm gonna give you the chance to do that and it's gonna feel weird when you say it at first, I think, but that doesn't matter, we're gonna do it together and, and I want you to make this as personal as you possibly can. I was gonna put my name in here, but I didn't want you saying my name and pointing your finger at me. I don't wanna say your name and point my finger at you. I want you to point the finger at yourself because we have enough to deal with ourselves. But I wanna say it like this. I have been set free from sin and I am a slave to righteousness. And I've tried to say this this week as I've been preparing to teach this to you and even when we went downtown to record, to film. And it did feel a little weird at first. I mean, it feels a little strange, but I want, I want to encourage you to say this in the morning when you wake up this week and you can download it on your notes if you want to, or you can write it down. It's Romans 6, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 18. Or perhaps when you find yourself falling into whatever it is that you can't seem to get past, your thing. Maybe it's just something that you need to remember, to bring up, to tell yourself in the Lord, I've been saved. The blood of Jesus has cleansed me of my sin. I'm a child of God, a follower of Christ. I have been set free from sin and I'm a slave to righteousness. Now we're gonna say it together. We're all gonna say it at the same time, okay? Now I'll start reading. We all read at the same time. Are you ready? Has everybody got it? We're gonna do it. Might feel a little weird, but when you say it out loud, well, it just becomes more real and more powerful. At least I think it does. Are you ready? Ready? ready. On three, no, I'm kidding. All right, ready? I have been set free from sin and I am a slave to righteousness. Right thoughts, a right heart, right actions. One more time, please, with me. This will be the last time, ready? I have been set free from sin and I am a slave to righteousness. Through Jesus Christ, through his death, his burial and his resurrection, he has freed us from sin. He's forgiven us from our past and he's secured in us a future. In his strength and through him, we can live like children of God. Jesus said, don't sin. Father, thank you for today. And I thank you for my friends. I thank you for a message that just hits so personally. We identify sometimes with the men who were throwing rocks with the woman who was caught, who was stuck, who was guilty, with the crowd who's watching. What people who say they speak for you, how they treat others, whether there's grace and compassion, or rules, regulations, and legalism. They're looking to find you, Jesus. But the courtyard is crowded. And I pray that right now we would see Jesus, that we would hear those words as personally as if he were speaking them to us. I do not condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. Almost too good to be true, Father. I've been set free from sin. I'm a slave to righteousness, right thoughts, a right heart, right actions, a right relationship with you, peace and freedom from past, hope and guarantee of the future to come and meaning and significance in this life as we live for you loving and serving each other so that more people may see this power that comes through your son and our savior, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.